otherwise I would have had you use a, a you know a fake name, a pen name, and right. kind of hide. I just didn't want to be known as the Fifty Shades of Grey kind of writer right off the bat. So that'll come out later. Okay. All right. Well, that's cool. Coquina Fire. Interesting. I'll look for uh, that. Oh, Coconi. Coconi of the Co- fish. Coconi. Uh, Coconi's, yeah, Coconi Salmon. But it's not out. It, it's, it, you won't see it till I release it. It's okay. It's in the can. And okay. It's well, going to be edited and everything. Email me when you do, and I'll I'll definitely buy a copy, and I'll and I'll have you on whatever yeah. show I'm doing this yeah, show. Yeah, pretty or hot stuff. You'd probably like it. <laughs> <laughs> probably make more money than anything that I'll, I've ever that I'll ever write, just because of the content. But right. I just like I said, I wanted to put out something PG at first. Yeah. Well, these days, sex sells. That's pretty much what sells right now. Yep. Um. So you you seem to reveal hidden truths or wisdom or like knowledge in in your book Skeleton Dolls. For instance, early on the twins are speaking in what seems to be like an ancient druidic language, and one of the phrases they say translates to something like "flying unbalanced into the sun belies the truth." Uh, what does that phrase mean? It was just kind of an esoteric thing to say. We all know that Icarus, you know, flew to the sun because he wanted to be like a god. And whenever we try to be like gods, like the Tower of Babel, which, of course, this book is based upon in terms of its overall philosophy, that's why the subtitle of the book is called Children of the Tower, because it references the Tower of Babel. And that's what ties into the language, because that all is in the Bible. But when Icarus in Greek mythology flew to the sun, he was actually trying to become equal or touch the face of God, if you will. And, of course, the truth is we, we are humans. We're human-bound animals. We're not gods. Uh, although we have God-like qualities within us that we can tap into, uh, the truth is, is that we can't really ascend to that. And in his case, he got too close to the sun. His wax melted his feathers off, and the poor guy fell to the earth. Yeah, interesting. I, you know, my wife and I have been looking into uh, studying sun gazing, and they say if you're... You can actually look at the sun, and if you look at it, into it, you're looking into source, like the source energy that, I guess, created us. So that's yeah, pretty... You could probably do the same thing down at your local nuclear power plant, but I don't think anybody would advise that. <laughs> no, right. Yeah, and there is a nuclear power plant here in Florida, so but I don't, I don't go near it. Um, at one point in the story, the twins go missing, and... Um, like when, you know, when they go looking for uh, Luke, I remember that. And you refer to one of the officers searching for them as a peace officer. And I studied maritime and admiralty law, and I was just curious why you used the term peace officer. Am I reading too much into that? No, I, I don't think it was anything. That it, was, it was a quick way of just describing his character because he is, you know, uh, I think his name is, uh, I can't remember his name now. But anyway, he, he's, you know, He's a nice guy, he's practical, he, he goes the extra mile to try to find the kids, he doesn't get the parents all worked up, you know, he tries to keep everybody calm, and uh, when he does discover them, he's not troubled by the amount of time that he and his officers had to take, and he, you know, he, he tries to let the parents know that it was okay, that he was glad to help out, so he was kind of a peaceful person, even though he was a local sheriff. Mm, okay, okay. You know, and it's funny. I think, get, that was where the, I think that's where the word peace came in. Right, right. Yeah, because, I, you know, I kind of look at, well, in my show that I do on here, it's about admiralty law sometimes and maritime law and how to deal with solutions and how to deal with the police. And sometimes I, I kind of get into seeing how the truth is hidden in plain sight, which, you know, I'll get into in some more of the questions. But uh, I, yeah. knowing you and knowing the life that you've lived and all of the... You know, you know a lot of, you are a famous person for one thing, and you know a lot of famous people, and I'm sure you know a lot of interesting things that the common citizen doesn't know anything about. And when I was reading your book, I was reading it not just for entertainment, but I was looking for clues that you might be leaving in, you know, putting in the story there for people to learn from, I guess. You know what I mean? And that's and and understandably so because you're like the conspiracy guru. I love you for that. <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate <laughs> it. Somebody's got to do it, you know. I, I think everything is a conspiracy. It's just about who did the conspiring, you know. That's the question. Everything's right. a conspiracy, but who conspired? Yeah. But in this case, your question is just answer what he was a good cop. That's all. He was just a good cop, and so he was peaceful in in that sense. 
Yeah, good. And see, that's 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 perfectly fine answer for me, and I'm I'm able to live with that, you know. But at least I'm getting to ask you that question, just you know, yeah. to see where I can go with it. You know what I mean? I wanna, I I mean, I I love the fact that you're even doing this interview, and and I really honestly believe I really like your book. So um, yeah, let's I'm see. glad because it's my first, and uh, I wish I would not have self published it because I probably could have gotten a deal for it. But I didn't know if I had the gene, you know, and I'd never had anything released to public for sale like that before, uh, other than songs, of course. <laughs> and so I just had to see if I had the gene, so I had to kind of sacrifice this one on a self-publishing platform. And when you do that, you alienate all the agents and publishers. They don't want to talk to you because you've already spoiled everything by releasing it and making a little money and getting some reviews because they want to have their fingers and their hands on every part of the advancement of a piece of literary uh, you know, uh, content because they want to get their fingers involved and they want to invest their time into it because they don't get paid up front. They just want to make sure it's going to be a winner. But when you come out with something that's finished, done, and for sale, they're just like, well, you already you already blew it, so just give me your next book. Yeah, so, I can understand that. You know, it's kind of a choice you have to make. Do you want to have total control right. over it? Because I think that the story is actually, I mean, it's already almost in screenplay format in a way. You could turn that, you can turn this book into a screenplay tomorrow, you know, easily. Just, uh, and I think it's, it would be a great movie. In fact, I think it'd be a very important movie because of the subject matter with regard to Islamic radical terrorism, how lives are interweaved, um, esoteric, you know, the Aborigines, you even get into the Aborigines, which I'm going to ask you about, which I think is very interesting. You know, there's a lot of knowledge and wisdom in your book that people would really eat up in the movie theater. And if, you know, I, I think you should turn it into a screenplay and pitch it, uh, you know, but you know how I am about that. I, I think everything could be a movie, but I really think that you could do it and, and you have the contacts and you could put it into screenplay format and just start pitching it, you know, easily. Well, it's funny you mention that because I just uh, submitted the book to a thing I saw online called Tail Flick. And I'd never heard of it before, and I started reading it, and it, it you know, could be a come on. It was only 88 bucks to register my book for the year, but it was, it was actually a website that you put extensive information, uh, uh, scene plots, uh, character development. You enter everything in there, and then you come up with a simple one-paragraph description of what it is, and then directors and producers supposedly come onto this thing and browse it hmm. and look for ideas to make movies from. Well, I hope it. I hope that works out with that because I think it would be a great movie. And you yeah, know, it's called Tail Flick. Tail. If anybody's interested, that, okay. that's an amateur writer and wants to do that. Okay, interesting. Definitely. Um, yeah, I never, I never even heard of it. But yeah, I mean, that, that's that's that's. It's funny you mentioned it because I just did that the other day. But that's because that book that you're we're talking about right now is kind of dead in the water in terms of it being promoted because unless I can get it going individually. Nobody's going to really know because the agent and the publisher aren't going to touch it until I get signed on another book, which will be the sequel that I just finished. It's being edited right now. I actually have a sequel to this book. It's called uh, uh, Lesson in the Grotto, which ties into the story. And uh, it also ties in the next election. It ties in the uh, apocalyptic future. It's pretty amazing. And uh, I think it might even be a better book. Now, let me ask you that, this then, um, based on what I've read here in Skeleton Dolls and then your, your sequel coming out, how much of the stories, the storyline and the story is based on just your creative imagination and how much is based on things that you know or believe or are predicting? You know what I mean? What, what, where's the line between fact and fiction for you on this? Two words, Dan Brown. Okay, yeah. From what I understand, Dan Brown, when he wrote, um, I guess he wrote, what is it, Angels and Demons, right? And he wrote yep, yeah. um, uh, Da Vinci Code. The Da Vinci Code that he was Inferno, so yeah. Inception, you know, it's he seemed to have very clear working knowledge about those concepts. What he does is he takes facts that he, that he Googles, like I do, and he does research on true, uh, un, unrefutable facts, and he interweaves them inside the bullshit, or uh, he interweaves them inside the fiction, and uh, basically creates stories that you cannot say they aren't true, 
that you can't prove they are true. Mm. But what's great about it is the fact you can't prove they aren't true makes you wonder. You just kind of go, well, you know, that could be. It's kind of like that's the moment that you go, wow, this Dan Brown guy's a pretty good writer because you can't really prove it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's... Because I base most of the stuff in Skeleton Dolls on the Old Testament, whenever anybody tries to come at me with any kind of stuff, I go, hey, I didn't write it. It's in the Old Testament. Yeah, plausible deniability, I think, is what that's called. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Um, so the part where Luke comes back from the dead in the book and saves the uh, barn, I guess that's kind of the fictionalized portion of it in a way, huh? Well, that ties into the title, which is the doll portion. These girls actually have the psychokinetic ability through the incantation and through them conjuring up certain types of magnetic forces that have come from the center of the earth, tied in with uh, an ancient uh, uh, civilization that did the same thing with Tesla's theory of triangulation, and they're actually able to animate inanimate objects, mm -hmm. you know, uh, like we see in superhero movies and blah, 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 you know. And uh, they are able to animate these bones in a doll-like fashion, like a marionette. And that's where the title comes in. Now, I personally, I believe that those are real possibilities and real powers. Uh, my wife and I, we've been studying, uh, especially recently, magnetism and the way it works with the life force and the creative force. And i that's one of the things I really liked about your book is it's very close to, and I think... I think it's truthful. I think there's a lot of truth, in, especially when you get into the incantations and the ancient languages. Well, I'm glad you feel that way because that was my intent. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean they're true. It doesn't mean that they're proven. It doesn't mean that they're factual. But like I said, you can't deny that they might be able to exist. Yeah. Because uh, I, the way I explained it throughout the book is all done with scientific terms and with uh, references to, uh, you know, the physics and, uh, you know, things are just practically proven uh, on a scientific level on other areas that you just kind of go, you know, like you say, the, the uh, pl uh, plausible deniability is, 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 is nil because you can go, well, that could happen, but I've never seen it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's because maybe you haven't tried hard enough or you didn't look inside far enough. You know, you didn't, you didn't become like a yogi master. You didn't do Qigong and understand the, the father of all martial arts. If you can learn Qigong, you can move mountains. Yeah. You don't know that. Interesting. Right. You you can't just willy-nilly uh, blow it off like it's just a bunch of garbage and nonsense uh, without doing the work and the research, and I agree with you right. on that. Naysayers like are... It's really easy to be an armchair naysayer without doing any research. Yeah, exactly. And you know, you mentioned before that you and I worked on that project, I guess, the movie, uh, about 10 years ago, and I met the twins, and, and they definitely had, a when I met them, a very interesting and, and spiritual aura about them. I, I, you know, and now looking back, I, can, I, I see that. I, I can remember it. How much input did they have in, in Skeleton Doll beyond that story? Really? So you just took it from there and ran with it? Yep. I, I, I asked permission from the mom and from them, and they, they said, yeah, go ahead and run with that story. I mean, basically, I just wanted to tell the story about where they came from and the horse being euthanized and them digging up the bones. That was all basically all I wanted to use to get it started. And they said, sure, you can use that story. Oh, that's cool. And that's when they showed me the skull and everything, and I went like, wow. Hmm. Now, I'm a flat earther, and I don't know if you know this already, and I, I don't really believe we're on a spinning sphere. And there are a couple of times you write certain phrases in the book that make me think that you might be hiding the truth about the shape of the earth in plain sight. For instance, when Dan's TV catches on fi the barn on fire, you describe the morning heat coming by saying, quote, even though the sun was still a half an hour away. Now, is that just phraseology on your part, or, or are you hinting at a, a flat earth? Or am I just reading too much into it again? You're reading, you're reading too much into it, but that's okay. I mean, I, I have no prejudice against the, your, uh, your belief. Yeah, that's cool. I just want to ask. I have to ask. If I don't ask, I won't be able to sleep tonight, so I just had to ask. I'll just say, yeah. you know, I had no, Kenny I, Lee I right believe, there. And... I, believe, <laughs> I believe in the traditional... Uh, uh, of gravitational uh, forces holding this thing together 
And if you look at geophysics and astrophysics, everything points to the fact that we're spinning. 